All right, in, um, in, other, in another video, I talked a bit about uh, Grotowski's uh, impact on uh, theater culture in the 1960s and uh, uh, the consequences of his approach, his secretive approach to theater uh, and the new relations between text and performer, between performer and audience uh, that resulted from his unique approach to theater. Uh, I want to talk today, uh, or in this video, about um, uh, other approaches which um, emerged here in the United States uh, in an effort to change these relations between text and uh, performer and between um, uh, performance and audience. Uh, let me mention the living theater. Uh, the Living Theater actually began in the 1950s. It was the creation of a husband and wife pair team, Julian Beck and Judith Molina. Uh, they uh, had struggled to be to develop acting careers in New York City in the 1950s, and when opportunities did not emerge to the extent that they had hoped, they created their own theater that was uh, to enable them to do, to do work in the theater on their own terms. And the living theater in the late 50s and the early 60s uh, was like the poor theater of Grotowski, very austere, very uh, stripped down kind of theater. But they were doing classic works. Uh, and often um, very intense, realistic plays, such as Kenneth Brown's The Brig, uh, which they set in a, a theater uh, that they had reclaimed from uh, a space that had been designed for another purpose. And that's a feature of the living theater, as with many other radical groups during that time. They wanted theater to be in another space besides a place called the theater. The theater could occur anywhere in a place like this, classroom out on the street, um, on the roofs of buildings, and in places where you didn't expect theater to be. That theater could take over spaces and uh, transform those spaces and make them productive in ways that people didn't realize. Uh, well, that's what they did with the Living Theater, and in a very uh, famous production of um, this play, The Brig, they became intensely realistic in their portrayal of, a, uh, of life in a Marine Corps brig, and uh, dramatizing the racial tensions uh, that emerged in this brig, the sadism of the guards and the prisoners, uh, a lot of rough language in the play, and uh, it's a very sobering, violent image of the dehumanization of persons in this prison environment uh, and shaped by uh, government policy. The Marine Corps is the function of the government, and the government had this systematic way of treating uh, people who had run into trouble that is uh, quite brutal and, and um, frightening. And the brig was unique in, the, in so far as it had a different uh, spatial arrangement, the way Grotowski had with his 12-person audience. They had a small audience uh, for the living theater and wanted only a small audience. Uh, and uh, the actors, uh, again, were very close to the, uh, to the, odd, to the spectators. And um, they, uh, who were watching the play, uh, felt the intensity of the, a lot of the, the anger, the bad language, and, and uh, ferocious emotions really up close. Uh, and um, uh, in that sense, the living theater, through this super realism uh, of the play, 
attempted to dissolve the distinctions between life and art. The audience couldn't really appreciate the um, experience of the brig without in some sense becoming prisoners themselves within the um, environment of, of the play. And they became those prisoners to the extent that the actors were close to them, very close, uh, just practically in their laps. Um, but having done the brig, the, the backs, Julian and, and, and uh, Judith, had set upon a course of breaking down this distinction between life and theater. And the living theater went on uh, in the latter part of the 60s to create a unique idea of theater in which the audience became part of the production in a much more explicit way than anyone else. Uh, uh, Beck and Molina did a couple of productions in the late 60s, one uh, called Frankenstein, uh, in which the entire story of the Frankenstein myth, the mad doctor Frankenstein who creates the human, um, human monster uh, in his laboratory, they did this entire play with no set on a bare stage. And um, the set actually was created by bodies. That the, the bodies of the performers built uh, spaces upon which actors, uh, well, the actors inhabited these uh, structures, a sort of architecture built out of bodies with, that were linked to each other, standing on top of each other or crouching down and the persons uh, stand on them and the, this sort of fleshly, bodily structure moved and metamorphosed um, to uh, accommodate each separate scene, uh, which went through this uh, uh, story of the, the Frankenstein monster and his, the monster's relation to his creator. Uh, it's a spectacular kind of theater without being very spectacular, relying only on these bodies which were I think, almost entirely, if not completely naked, uh, to build the, um, the story. And the audience, of course, was brought in close around the, uh, the performers. And then they, having done that, they also did another play, perhaps their most par uh, famous, Paradise Now. Um, and um, uh, this never had any fixed text, nor did Frankenstein, but m sort of mutated from audience to audience. They took it all over the world. It went around um, the United States and ran into censorship difficulties with the police because of all the nudity and involved and it's tried to create this utopian community out of uh, the performers mingling or mixing with the audience. Beck and Molina wanted to discard the text altogether. Grotowski remained attached to the text but treated it as the basis for the struggle this conflict between the body and words and the uh, language that uh, is so hard to speak and which convulses the body. Beck wanted to move theater beyond drama and eliminate conflict altogether. They saw, he and Judith, saw theater as providing this alternative society or, or communal a uh, group that um, modeled a new way of living. And the purpose of theater was to open up the possibilities for um, a new, uh, for, for a different society and new relations between human beings. Uh, so that Beck discarded the, the text altogether. No play. Theater is not about plays. It's not about scripting anything, moved to a heavily improvisatory uh, kind of performance, which was to invite the audience in. And by discarding language, you are also discarding 
all these masks that you as a spectator wear when you come to the theater or wherever you go. You are someone's son or daughter. You are a student somewhere or you are a worker or an employee somewhere or um, you are a spouse or, or a girlfriend or uh, a lover of someone or you are um, uh, a friend or somebody uh, you owe somebody money so you are a debtor or somebody owes you money and so um, you have these roles, uh, these identities uh, either imposed upon you or acquired and Beck said that's the basis for conflict within our society, it's the basis for oppression which leads to struggle uh, and injustices and all kinds of other bad unhappy things that happen to people when they are part of a society. Theater from his point of view should provide that opportunity for us to free ourselves from all of these identities, these masks that we assume. So when we come to the theater, to the living theater, to Paradise Now, we have the opportunity to discard our masks and assume new, new, new identities or perhaps a life that is without any clear sense of identity. And that means stop being somebody's son or daughter or stop being a parent or stop being uh, in some way controlled by these other identities. Discard them. Join us. Become part of a new commune. We have no names. What do we need names for? We don't need uh, uh, to work, um, act out these roles that we follow when we're not in the theater. Uh, join us. Discard your clothes. Discard your past. Discard all that's holding back those buried energies within you. And uh, uh, f uh, join us, the living theater, as we venture around the world, bringing this opportunity to those who are, like those in the brig, imprisoned by the society in which they live. And we don't realize it. So with Paradise Now you had this kind of show, which wasn't really a show. Uh, Beck came out practically naked, if not naked. It depended on where they were doing it because they got arrested. The police came and said, this is not, um, uh, according to our laws of decency, permissible. Uh, so they went to jail. That enhanced their appeal considerably uh, for many audiences back then. And then they uh, went to court and uh, endured whatever um, punishment or not, since the court sometimes said the police had not done the right thing in arresting uh, the, uh, the performers. And we'll talk about that in a later video. But uh, in any case, audiences came. They came in swarms. Uh, and Beck would invite them up and say, we have no show. We're just here to let you in to our lives, into the living theater. We think the Vietnam War is wrong. We think it's wrong to have all these laws against smoking marijuana. And Beck would light up marijuana and right there on the stage and start smoking it. And um, uh, he would invite them to come on, on and join them in their naked environment and, and free themselves from whatever is holding them back from that act. What is it that holds you back when you go to the theater and somebody says, we want you up here with us. Discard your clothes and join us. And be as naked as we are. And perhaps you will follow us after the show, however long it lasts, is over. And they'll maybe find yourself in another city, having abandoned your, the life you were leading before you came. Uh, and it's surprising, maybe now, 
to the, the extent to which they were successful in creating this. The, the, the Living Theater had so many people joining it, and then they leave it, and then they... But the action that happened was basically what happened when those people in the audience joined the performers and interacted. What did they say to each other? Well, it was different every time. It was never the same. That is paradise. Paradise now, when you are in this environment and find yourself saying things you didn't know you would say, and people are saying things to you you didn't know you could say, they would say, and uh, you don't know how it's going to end, or if it will end, that's the major transformation. That's the, the new paradise uh, envisioned by the Becks. And for a number of years, into the, well into the 70s, they took this show around the world and found adherents. They also found jail cells waiting for them in places like Argentina and elsewhere when uh, they did things that uh, the society around them felt was not appropriate. Um, but uh, you can see how different that kind of theater would have been for that time because it seems awfully different to us now. And it's really difficult to find any theater <laughs> even approaching that kind of radicalness, even though it was devoid of conflict. Beck didn't have any, if you don't want to go up there, that's fine. He's not uh, compelling anybody uh, and uh, is largely indifferent to the sort of entertainment values that most people associate with going to the theater. That's a consequence of breaking down this distinction between life and art, a major extraordinary achievement of the 1960s. Uh, the Living Theater kind of ran out of energy in the, the 80s after having to deal with so many legal troubles, and its heritage was pretty solid. Beck went on, he got acting roles, you can see him in Episodes of Miami Vice, uh, playing gangsters and other uh, strange characters. But uh, uh, he and his wife remain remarkable personalities of a very turbulent time. And uh, their approach uh, to um, transformation of the theater uh, was certainly distinct from uh, Grotowski's. 